the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, it is a uh, it is it is a great privilege for me to be here with my family. So my three children, and my wife, are here by the grace of God, and the three children. Uh, it's always interesting that they are in the U.S. It's been there for the last ten days, but my middle daughter always asking me. When, when are we reaching America? <laughs> so she has no idea where she is now, but she's just enjoying the journey. So, <laughs> so it's a privilege to be here. So my name is Aich Luhum. So there are a couple of people who know some Amharic here. So my name is, you know, in Ethiopia, everybody has a name and it's meaning also. So the meaning is very important when the parents name their children. So the name Aich Luhum means no one can defeat you. And I think, you know, it was not something that the name that I enjoyed with in my childhood because in the elementary school, I think the reality was not really true. <laughs> so people were, well, I was not really beating everybody. So I said, what? So I even so thought sometimes, you know, I wish if my name would be changed. But when I came to the Lord, that makes a sense for me. And now I am in the Lord. I am in Christ Jesus. Then as the Bible says that, you know, Jesus will build with that conviction and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. So that's the word of God. So I came to the Lord almost 30 years ago. It seems a coincidence that I happen to be in the church. And that church was, you know, the church that my sister used to go and is going, actually. And, uh, you know, my sister had never shared with me the gospel. It is only because of my mother's day that I have to be with my sister. Then I have to leave. But the commitment is no gospel preaching with me. Enough. So, But one day I was so bored in the house, she was about to leave. So she asked me if I can, I can join her. I said, okay, let me do some joking. So I went there. In that, in that moment, I don't know what happened, but as if somebody has told that preacher, the preacher was talking about my story. Because I was heartbroken, very depressed, tried to kill myself twice, and hung myself one time, and my friends broke the house and rescued me. Another time also, nobody was there, but there was a voice that came and I went there. I was thinking of one day I would kill myself, but the reason that I was living was for my younger sister, so that she would have a secure place and then I would kill. But this preacher was preaching really, and not only that one, I start myself to see crying. I've never cried in that one, so I said, what happened to me? Because I used to be normal, I used to be okay. I was a joker, you know, I was out. I know with my children, with my friends, I was the entertainer, I know a lot of jokes, so, but I was crying, so I don't want my sister to see me, I just keep wiping my cheeks. Uh, so, and then finally he said, if you want to come, so he made an altar call, I wish to go, but I said, how come, I'm, as an African man, you know, <laughs> I, I can be, is the defeat? So I say, I didn't go. So the program was finished, and the next, as we are going, my sister asked me, how was it? I said, oh, I think everybody looks like they are drunk. <laughs> so they are shouting and everything, raising hands. You know, in the middle of our life, three, four o'clock, what happened? But I said, I like the preacher. The preacher is logical. You must have paid him a lot of money. He said, no, 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 he's serving God. You know, if you like, next week he's going to preach in this place. I said, no. But I got the date. Next week, Saturday. So I was counting the date, the weeks, the, the hours, and the seconds. So Saturday has come. I went early in the morning at 7 o'clock. Nobody was at the church except the guard. So I asked him, the guard, is there any preaching going on in this place? He said, yeah, today at 10 o'clock. I said, what, 10 o'clock? Yeah, can I enter and just wait? He said, no, not allowed to enter, but you can wait, you can come back, you know, you, you like, it looks like me, like I'm a stranger. I said, no, I'm not living anywhere, I will sit. So I sat outside of the church until the program starts at 10.30, 10.30. 10 
Then the singing was going on. The same preacher came. I was so excited. <laughs> then he started preaching. He preached about 45 hours. But like for me, it's so long, like 45 hours. Finish and call me. I'm ready. Then, then he finished and he made an altar call. I was the first to be at the altar call and welcoming Jesus as the Lord and my Savior. That day, I made a covenant and fell in love with Jesus Amen. and with the Word of God. I read, I was in high school by then, you know, there is biology in my exercise book, in the middle there is a Bible. So I all, I fell in love with the Bible, so out of the week, about four days, I sleep in the church's floor, praying and reading the Word of God. Suddenly, after a few years now, the Lord talked to me as I was praying uh, that He will make me His witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all over the world. By then, you know, I was in the eastern part of Ethiopia, in the city called Harar, and near Dawa, very highly Islamic. I've never traveled to the capital city. And this guy that I've never even traveled 50 kilometers beyond, God telling him, I will be my, you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all over the world. It looks like a wild dream. But I got it and just, just keep praying. That in Ethiopian history, there was the first time 21 years ago that the church felt a calling for a cross-cultural mission where to really train Ethiopian missionaries to send to the neighboring people groups. So when the, our, our, our church was about 2,000 by then, so the elders came to my mind, so they called me, when they called, the elder called me, that I must be in trouble, so how, what have I done? Then they called me that, we're praying about this first Ethiopian church's cross-cultural mission, and the Lord has put you in our heart, and we're going to send you to mission school. So that's why the journey that I've started 21 years ago began. Then I became a missionary among the Somali for six years. Then the last 15 years and plus, I've been involved in, in cross-cultural mission. Out of this, especially the last eight years, what God has done in my region, in the region of Horn of Africa, where we have over 158 people group, 159 million people, uh, people, you know, in that what God has done, if I was not in the country, in the region, somebody telling me I could, have, I could have not believed that. But God has given me an opportunity, a privilege to see God working and penetrating people group, even for the people group as have been considered and reached and engaged the hardest. The people group in the area that has been called a missionary graveyard in becoming a vineyard. So God has done a lot, and I've seen the last eight years in our region only over 7,000 house churches have been planted. Over 200,000 people came to the Lord and fell in love with Jesus. About 35% out of that are from Muslim background. So, the last April, May, June 2016, we just finished the reporting, 285 churches have been planted. Over 3,000 people joined the kingdom of God. This is just the last April, May, and June. This is God doing. I just, this 5 o'clock, this morning, I was receiving a call from Somalia. One of our coordinator called, our coordinator called Abdu Samet. And he was telling me and sending me with Viber about the ministry that the discipleship that he has done in Somalia, where Pastor Jeff said, as he said that where you are not allowed, as another citizen even in Somalia, you are not allowed to, to celebrate Christmas. If you happen to do that one, you'll end up in prison. Where they say that there is no gospel, we are a Muslim nation, so you are not able, allowed to, to, to practice your Christianity. In that one, indigenous Muslims are coming to the Lord, falling in love with Jesus. Sometimes they may not be able to come together physically, but thanks to God, to the technology, there is a conference call that's going to happen. You know, I said, 
no, used phones, you know, <laughs> unlocked phones, I collect them and I put SD card, you know, 4 GB, 6 GB, 16 GB, the Word of God, audio Bible, discipleship material, all the message that we have and, you know, cover it in a little bit of 2-3 passwords, then they go. So people, when they have a discovery, they just call themselves, you know, and they discuss about the Word of God. You know, if they want to devote or hear the Word of God, they just influx and nobody knows whether they are, they are listening to Somali song or the Bible, nobody knows. So thanks to the technology that God is doing something strange in Ethiopia, in the Horn of Africa. Not in the Horn of Africa, I've traveled in Asia, I've traveled in North, uh, the Middle East, I have traveled in North Africa, I have trained several thousand and hundreds of people, church planters globally, and mission agencies as well. And God is doing something strange in our age. Pray the Lord. So as I was praying, you know, as Pastor Jeff asked me to really share the word of God last, last time when I came here in February. So I was being trained. So as I was praying and fasting, there is a word to speak. This is a message that God has given me. It seems, it seems simple. It seems, it seems ABCD or the first primary thing. But I would like to tell you that I think God wants us to make that simple main thing the main thing. And that word comes from Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 20. And this, the topic of my sermon is the mandate of the Great Commission. The mandate of the Great Commission. So we have a mandate as a Christian, as a believer that Christ Jesus has given us. If you have a Bible, you can open it with me, and I, I will read it, but just uh, let, me, let me read it from uh, verse 16. I read it in the name of Jesus. It says, Matthew 28, verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubt. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always. To the very end of the age. Just want to give you a context with this one. Because this is the most important thing, one of the most important things that Jesus has commanded his disciples. It's not an advice. It's not like if you are willing, if you want. Or it's, not, it's a commandment. And the commandment is, is like a word of military. You gotta do this. It must be done. It won't be done in the generation that the disciples were living and that we are living. So it's, it's just a must. You know, Jesus was about to live and this is the most important season. And normally we call it the Great Commission, even though in the Bible it doesn't tell us that word, Great Commission. We don't find it a Great Commission, but it's a great message. It's a Great Commission. Why? I just want to give you five reasons why the Great Commission is great. The first one is, the Great Commission is great because of by whom it is given. You know, the person who has given us the Great Commission is Jesus Christ, who he said after his incarnation, he said, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. So, so that God has given a message. That Jesus has given a message. A resurrected Jesus has given a message. I always go in a very, you know, sometimes humanly speaking, scary places. I say humanly speaking. That you don't know whether you are coming back home and kiss your children and you, you know, you just don't have that guarantee. It's, it's real. It's like, like black and white. It happened to me just two weeks ago before I come here. I don't know whether I come back, I will make home. So I have to sometimes 
months in the journey, two weeks ago, I have to report myself. I was in a very risky area where the tribal clash has happened in the northern Sudan border. So it was, the place is very dangerous. It was at dark. I was driving, the, the guy who was taking me was driving a motorcycle to risk us with about 100 miles, you know, this, just in a bumpy, muddy road. And just, I don't know, so I have to report myself of the situation so that if something has happened so that my phone recorded video could get to my wife so that you know to, to, to share the experience so you don't know what it is and there are places in countries that they tell you it is not allowed to share the gospel but you know what I think the Great Commission the person who said so who has given is the God who created the heaven and the earth Pray the Lord. And also, it's, it, it is great also to whom? Because it is to whom it is given. It's being given to the disciples. It's being given to the, to, to, to the people who are following Jesus. To the people who have tested the love of Jesus. So one, it is great because of its extent. He said that in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all over the world. So it is great because of its extent. And also it is great because of its purpose. The purpose of the Great Commission is making disciples. People's life changes because of this message. I'm not saying, I didn't say people's life will get improved. It will change. It's a radical change. From the darkness to the light. No religion will bring this change. One time, I was, I, was, I was in one town on, uh, talking with one of the Islamic cleric, very known cleric, very known, his name is Ali, he's a sheikh, so his father built a big mosque in one of, the, we consider it a Christian city in Awas, so he's very much, so when I entered to him, he asked me, Aichi, which Bible version do you want? You know, to a dialogue with me. Can I give you NIV, KGV, the Amharic, this one? So he has all in his shelves. So I realized that I can't really talk argument with this guy. He has already got all the theological things. So I told him, Ali, you know, today I want to be a Muslim. And I want to be a Muslim. But you have to tell me, what can I get? If I become a Muslim, you say, "Oh, eternal life, you know, Jannat, you know, that's that's the thing. That's who, what else do you want?" He said, "Oh, wow, good, okay." So if that means that as a Muslim you have already confirmed that you have eternal life. Well, that I don't know. You know, only Allah knows or the Creator knows. Even He said that you don't know that. You know? not only me, even our Prophet doesn't know. You know? Because that's in the Bible, in the, in the book, because uh, he said the, the prophet was saying that, you know, Allah put one in the right hand, in the left hand, I don't know where I am. <laughs> that's yeah. the correct, in the direct word for the prophet. So, I told him, okay, you know, if I become, to a Muslim, become a Muslim, I don't have any guarantee that where I am in the right place, because the prayer is, lead me to the right place, to right, the right religion, the right way. And I don't, I, don't, I don't have a guarantee, but if I can tell you, if you come to the Lord and confess, and the moment that you are confessed, you sin, and you know, say that, God, this is my life, and I want to dedicate with you, you will receive a confirmation that you begin a fellowship with Jesus. So the half-day conversation has ended with 25 minutes conversation, because he was not able to bring any logic to us. To that one. So the purpose of the Great Commission makes it unique. I think the fifth one, the Great Commission is great because of its promise. And it has a promise. God is way before us, before even we are trying to engage with those people. With the people that we are afraid of. With the people that they don't align with us. Just let me give you the Great Commission context. When Jesus was telling these disciples, there were 11 disciples. Most all of them came from one background, Jewish background. Nobody was a Gentile, those 11. The 12 one and the 12 one, Judah, you know, killed themselves. These are 11 Jewish disciples. 
In that time also, the political situation was so different because the Romans was leading them or colonizing the Jewish. So they don't like, the Jewish don't like the Romans. They don't have a good relationship. If somebody as a Jewish is working for the Romans as a tax collector or other things, they don't like, they don't align with it. Jewish don't marry with the Romans by then. The Jewish children don't play with the Roman children. Jewish businessmen will not do any business with the Roman businessmen. So there is a big we and them. And with that kind of situation, when the Jewish were really expecting a deliverer, a deliverer who can deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. Because you can remember what they said at the end, even before his ascension. Where can you bring? When can you bring your kingdom? So in that situation, this, you know, for these 12, 11 disciples, Jesus was saying, now go. Go to them. You know, it's a, it was a shocking news because it's easier the Jewish to preach for the Jewish. It is very, very difficult. A Jewish to deliver the message, the loving message of Jesus Christ to the Romans in that context. It happened to me. It happened to me. I didn't like the Somalis. I don't like the Somalis. I just, because of the class that we had, you know, my family taught me that not in business. We don't have any business with the Somalis. And God, 21 years ago, I asked him, where can I begin? And God said, the Somalis. I said, God send me anywhere, anywhere, but not the Somalis. I love them generally, but not specifically engaging with them. I was born among them, but refused to learn their language. Refused, intentionally refused. When I grown up, there is three languages that I grown up. Amharic, Romo, and Somali, and Harari, actually four. Out of that one, three of them I was able to speak and grown up with those languages. I refused intentionally to learn the Somali language among the communities that I grew in, I was born in grown up. So I say, God, no to Somalis. Or if it is a month later, God insisted that. As I was praying, and I, it's just like, you know, but the voice was coming. This is where he wanted me. And finally I asked God, Give me the things that I don't have. If you are really sending me these people, if this is going to be my first mission field, give me the thing that I don't have. To be honest, God, I don't have deeper life for them. To be honest, God, I don't have that. I love that one desperately taking me and sharing Jesus in thinking that to bring them to the Lord. I can share the that. That I, I'm washing my hand and just, you know, I, I, I'm afraid. But that intent, and I don't have to be honest, God, I don't have passion. You know what? God has done it. Until now, I even don't know how He did it. But let me tell you, my brothers and my sisters, I love the Somalis as if they are my blood brothers and sisters. Some of them might take my jacket, some of them, you know, the Somali culture, if they come to your house and if it is getting cold, they will take the jacket and they go. If there is somebody that's also feeling cold, they will give you jacket. And then sometimes it happened to me like that. There was a very nice suit that I love, the jacket. You know, I bought expensive. Almost it took me half of my sal month's salary to buy that jacket. So a Somali brother came and just took it one day and then, you know, he didn't remember that. Returned it back. I asked him, Ahmed, where is that jacket? He said, Oh, I, I gave it to the son to, 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 to Kamal. Oh, okay, can you ask Kamal? He asked, Oh, Kamal, Kamal said, Oh, I gave it to Usman, and Usman is in Hargeisa now. I think he gave it to Muhammad also. <laughs> <laughs> so, no permission. <laughs> because in that culture, whatever you have is theirs, and whatever they have is yours. So, that sharing is there. So I love that one. So I think these disciples have been challenged to be confronted, to come out their comfort zone. 
Because Jesus, who has all the authority, is asking them a favor to do. To come out from their comfort zone and to go to the people they are crying empty inside. And he just told them what, are they, what they need to do. One thing. The other thing will be embedded. One thing, one thing, one thing. I think church, I would like to underline also, Christ want, to, want us to do one thing. He said, as you go, the other words, the, the, the version, he says, as you go, when you're going, make disciples. Make disciples. That verb, that action is the center point of the Great Commission. And some people say there is a great omission in the Great Commission. Because some of the missionaries might have cross-culture and stay in that people group, but they fail in this, uh, making disciples that can make other disciples. Their presence has been felt, but they were not able to penetrate it. As a church, I think it's more than being among the community. The church, God has called us to penetrate the community, to make disciples who can make other disciples. It's not like converting them from this religion to the other religion. You know, we have a movement among the Coptic Orthodox in our, in our, in our, in our movement, and we are focusing on the priests. Priests, you know, 100 priests, uh, one priest, will have easily 100 family, you know? And he can come anytime and can tell to the family, I want to deliver a message. They will sit, they will stop whatever they are doing. So what we are doing is there are about 44,000 Orthodox priests in the country and we are asking what will it take to reach those 44,000 of priests in the country so that we see the evangelical Ethiopian Coptic Orthodox Church. So we are asking them that the, the priests, they don't need to come out and change religion. They can be there and be the light of Jesus Christ in making other disciples. So I call it, we have now many churches within the Orthodox Church. I call it churches within the church. So the main thing is not converting from one party to another party, making disciples. What is discipleship? Discipleship is a process where a lost person will come, will begin a journey, and a journey that he will, until he fell in love with Jesus. A journey until he say that, God, you are my Lord, and you are my Savior. So the disciple making is an action. The disciple making is not an option. As a church, I think this, this commandment has not been given to specific people. It's not only for the clergy. It's not only for the pastors, the evangelists, or the teachers, or some groups. Because the reason that God has emphasized me so much in my church, I am an elder. And also in Ethiopia, different network in terms of mission. I am involved in being a board member or an advisory or an action, you know, a lot of, lot of things I am involved with. One of the sad things that I observe in our, in our evangelical world today in Ethiopia is the Cape Commission has been put in one department. It could have been the whole department. The church puts evangelism as women's program, men's program, choir program, counseling program, evangelism program, or discipleship program. Whereas the Bible says, everything that you do, everything that you do has to be merged, has to be in line with the main thing where Jesus said, go and make disciples. I think the women's program is great, but they have to ask, how can I make disciples in this women's program? I think the youth program is wonderful, but they have to ask that, how do we make the main thing the main thing, which is making disciples? And the elders program, everything, because I think this is the, 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 the reason that the church is surviving. The church is living. As a believer, we are living. So I have a motto for my church, my, church, my disciples that I, I always tell. And uh, soon in Bali area, we have about over 1,000 churches now, we have about 1,000 youths that you will be, I'll be uh, engaging with. 
I tell them, everybody who accepts Jesus Christ is a believer. Every believer is a disciple. Every disciple is a disciple maker. Every disciple maker's house is a potential church. You know, I think we have to live with that single-minded Christianity that I'm a believer, I'm also a disciple, I'm also a disciple maker. My house is one for potential to become a church. My family is the potential to become a church. And then at the end he said, baptize, teach them to obey, and then if you do this, you should not be afraid of anything because I am with you. The presence of God is conditioned. This especially as far as Matthew 28, 20 is concerned. The promise is conditional. It is working for those who are engaged in disciple making. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to challenge you today. How are you doing with this great mandate? Are you making the main thing the main thing? Are we implementing this great commission with the focus of discipleship? May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Ask you. Pray. Lord, Lord Jesus, we are um, we are stirred 